orders one? Nine one. One nine one. Okay. You were close. A minus. And if you remember that I asked for you to remind me, marching orders one nine one. So what we need to do, what we need to do this afternoon, is we need to bring. Well, we need to bring McClellan and Rodney Lee together with the Battle of Antietam, the most well-preserved battlefield, well, in the Eastern Theater. And then Mary Todd Lincoln and the difficulties that she got into. And Mary Todd Lincoln, uh, one of her difficulties is that she was OCD. She simply could not spending, buying, spending, buying, and not even wearing the 400 pair pair of gloves that she bought. She just put them in whatever, the armoire. And then what we need to do is we need we need to have Lincoln per, we need to have Lincoln to per, bring out his preliminary emancipation proclamation. And, and then we're we're pretty much wrapped up for this piece. And then we, we, we need to do Gettysburg and then wrap it up. And maybe we can wrap it up next week or the next month or the month after that and get Lincoln re-elected, we have to get him re-elected. <laughs> then we have to get him shot. I mean, it, it doesn't work unless we get him shot. And that begins the apotheosis, the, um, the, the reverence of Abraham Lincoln. The, and depending on which presidential historian that one speaks with or reads about, it's either Lincoln, Washington, Franklin Roosevelt, or Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, and George Washington. So let's get going here. And, and just to make the transition from last month to this month, I recall that we, we said this together, that Lee, that Robert E. Lee, the Army of Northern Virginia, that he'd been able to push McClellan away from Richmond. And a Union Army will not be as close as McClellan was in the summer of 1862 until General Grant in the late summer of 1864. So, so the Union Army had been pushed away by Lee. And for Lee, and here's the phrase that we used last month, and the phrase is that Lee was concerned with what he called the arithmetic of the thing. And if you remember, it's simply that the North has more people than we do. And they have more resources than we do. The arithmetic of the thing. That if this war continues, we lose a long war. And, and for him, the numbers were there. And, and there, was, there was no playing tricks with the numbers. Now, this isn't your 1040. Now, the numbers were there. And that we lose a long war. So in the late summer of 1862, with McClellan you know, pushed away from Richmond, that Lee takes the war north. And he takes the war north in, into Maryland for a number of reasons. One, as we've just said, you know, the arithmetic of the thing. And then secondly, and, and then secondly, that we need foreign recognition. And if we get di diplomatic recognition from England in particular, or France, that might help us achieve our independence. So we need foreign recognition, and I need a victory on northern soil. A victory on northern soil in Maryland will collapse the morale the off-year elections are coming up in November. Lee read the Northern Papers, and he knew that there was a deep morale problem here because the casualties kept mounting and mounting and mounting, and, and there wasn't any, any, any success. The war just continued, and those casualty numbers continued to grow. So here is Lee. If I can have a significant victory on Northern soil sometime in the early fall, it will affect Lincoln's popularity, it will affect the popularity of the Republican Party. And with the off-year elections, the Democrats, and the South was Democratic, the Democrats might seize control of Congress, and we might be able to negotiate some sort of a settlement. And the settlement would be the freedom of the Confederate States of America. And that's what Lee is thinking as he splashes that army north across the Potomac into Maryland. Lee is on the loose. Lee is on the loose. And he divides his army into three sections. Here comes, here comes Marching Orders 191. He divides his army into three sections so they can live off the land. And he's at the center. And then, and then, there's, then, then there's Pete Longstreet and there's Stonewall Jackson. 
and they're and they're heading north, and they're divided by you know 45 or 50 miles to be able to live off the land, you know, the rich farms of Maryland. And as that army begins to move north, separated, that one of the officers, and it's, it's not in Lee's division, it's in Longstreet's, it's in Longstreet's. One of Lee's Longstreet's officers mis doesn't misplace. He drops and he loses the marching plans. You know, where Lee had divided his army, where they were, and the distances between them and where they were going to meet when they finally got deep into Maryland. And, and that officer, I've, 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 I've got to go back and check his name, he dropped his marching orders, he dropped the orders, he lost them. And, and, and maybe this was, he was leaning over to pick up a saddle and a saddle's horse to get moving. Uh, maybe he, he leaned over and they fell out of his jacket pocket. And as, as, as Longstreet broke camp. McClellan was following Lee's army. He did not want to engage it. Remember, McClellan was always fearful of getting beaten, wasn't he? But I'm, I'm stalking him. And, and McClellan's people moved into that deserted campsite to see what they could find. What's there? And they're stirring the ashes and looking around, and one of McClellan's guys finds marching orders 191. And they make their way to McClellan's tent, to McClellan's office, if you will. And there they are. Lee is here. Longstreet is here. Stonewall Jackson is here. You know, they're divided by 45 or 50 miles. And, and this, is the, this is the absolute coup, the intelligence coup of the, of the war between the states. And McClellan doesn't know how to act on it. And he calls in, you know, he calls in his Alan Pinkerton. We talked about him, didn't we? Alan Pinkerton, his scout, and he shows it to Pinkerton. And McClellan is concerned that this is a trick. It's a trap that these orders were left there deliberately, and McClellan would, in a rash way, attack, and Lee really would have his army together, all together, and that McClellan would be defeated in Maryland, and Pinkerton, Pinkerton knows what McClellan wants to hear, and, and General, this may be a trap, you know, that, you, that this trap will spring on you, and you need to be careful, you need to be careful. It was the intelligence coup of the war, and McClellan proceeds slowly shadowing the Army of Northern Virginia into, into Maryland. Now, Lee finds out that these marching orders have been lost, you know, have been left at a campsite. And he assumes, correctly so, the very worst, that McClellan has found them, and that he's moving rapidly to act on them, and he's going to attack me piecemeal, then he's going to attack Longstreet, then he's going to attack Stonewall Jackson, because our armies are spread out, and he has twice as many soldiers as I do. He'll pinch us off, one army, two armies, three armies. So Lee, Lee sends his, his quickest couriers, find Longstreet, find, find Jackson, and tell them to march fast, post haste, a, a forced march, meet me at Antietam. The, 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 the attack has been compromised. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And McClellan, moving slowly, <laughs> moving slowly, finds Lee, dug in, just Lee, you know, dug in the high ground, dug in at, at Antietam. And up comes McClellan, and he's very unsure. Is this a trick? Where, where's the rest of the, unit of the Confederate Army? Where are they hiding? You know, where are they hiding? And he moves cautiously. They're not hiding anywhere. They're on a forced march to join Lee at the crest of Antietam, at the battlefield. And, and Lee, and, and Lee, he knows he's outnumbered, and he gets lucky. He gets lucky because McClellan is cautious, too cautious, and the word has been sent, again, to Longstreet, you know, and, and, to, and to Stonewall Jackson, hurry, 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 I can only hold on for so long. And what Lee is able to do, and, be, and he's able to move what soldiers he had to the center and push McClellan back. Did I lose? No, there we go. To the center. And then McClellan pulls back, and then attack on the left. I move to the left. 
because I've got this shortest distance between, between two points. McClellan pulls back. Then he moves to the right. I move to the right and push him back. And he's losing men. I can only hold on for so long. McClellan at the end of the day, and the end of the day is in September of 1862, McClellan fails to commit a quarter of his army. They stay inactive. They're under the trees. I'm fearful that Lee is going to pull a rabbit out of the hat and suddenly the rest of the Confederate army is going to be there and I'll be overwhelmed. I need to hold a quarter of my army in reserves just in case. And Lee can hear them coming. He can hear Longstreet's units coming. He can hear, again, Stonewall Jackson's units coming. And, and, and Lee bobbing and weaving, bobbing and weaving. And here they come, you know, firing their muskets, and they're running. As soon as they heard the gunfire, this was no longer a forced march. They were running into the line. And, and, and there's Lee. Go Alabama. Go Texas. Go Mississippi. Go, go, go. And they ran into the line, and McClellan froze, pulled back, and retreated. And Lee retreated. Lee retreated back across the, the Potomac into Virginia. McClellan, you know, sends a, a, an over-the-top telegram to Lincoln, you know, that I've driven Lee from our territory, from our soil. And Lincoln is so disappointed. Did you, are you pursuing him? Why would I want to do that? I'm afraid I have driven him from our soil. Lincoln, it is all our soil. I never recognize secession. Chase them, chase them. And McClellan, my troops are tired. And we've heard this before. I need more horses. I need more artillery. I need more men. And for, for Lincoln, I've had it with this guy. I'm going to remove him from command. But I do not want to do it prior to the election. Because McClellan is, he's popular with his troops. And he's popular with the families of his troops because he doesn't use the army. You know, we're minimizing our, our fatalities, our deaths. So the election comes and goes, and, and the Republicans are not driven from Congress. And with the end of the election, Lincoln fires McClellan. And for McClellan, the reason he's fired me is that I'm a Democrat, and he's a Republican. And Lincoln does not want a successful Demo Democrat Democratic general to win battles and to perhaps challenge him for the presidency at some point. He's fired me because he fears me politically, and I have the support of the, of the populace and my troops. Now, none of that is true, but it's McClellan coming up with a cover story. In 1862, Mary Todd Lincoln gave a party. She gave a party. The, re the opening of the newly renovated and redecorated White House. It had not been redecorated for years. And you know, you know that every, every new First Lady has a budget. I mean, it's a minimalist budget to replace, maybe do wallpaper and carpeting, maybe replace the dishes, the silverware. Do you remember the trouble Nancy Reagan got into no. when she cleared out all the, all the old chip china? Whatever it cost her. Mary Todd Lincoln, OCD, she liked to spend money. And, and with the fact that her husband was so busy, he had no time for her. And even, and, and even, and even though we've said this, even though Lincoln himself suffered from bouts of melancholia, you know, bouts of depression, the war kept him busy. Mary had very little to keep her busy, uh, except for the children. And she wanted to redecorate the entire White House. When she and her sisters you know, had their first courtesy call at the White House, it's called the Executive Mansion. It's not called the White House until Theodore Roosevelt becomes president. But I'll slip into that terminology. It works for us. And the place was all busted up. Uh, the, the furniture was broken. There were two pieces of china that matched uh, that the the dishes were cracked, and that the, the, the upstairs quarter, when Mary walked up into the upstairs quarter, she gasped and stepped back, and she told her sister, sister, sisters, 
It looks like ghosts live here. The place looks like it's full of bats at night. What a dump. This is the White House. What a dump. And there on the carpet in the Oval Office were large brown swatches of dried something. And the dried something was dried tobacco. And, these, and Buchanan, who was the only president to be single, had card games on Friday and Saturday night. Drinking and card games, and the guys chewed tobacco. And if you don't hit the, the spittoon, don't worry about it. My wife won't complain. I don't have a wife. And therefore, she's not going to be in my ear that we're up too late, drinking too much, and you're spitting on the carpet. And Mary, what is this? What is this? We need to, we need to, com we, we need to completely renovate the whole place. And Lincoln said whatever. You know, whatever. And as far as Lincoln was concerned, he was just happy in a clap and watching Monday Night Football or a hockey game. That, I mean, that's Lincoln. And as Mary began to slowly redo everything, and I was reminded that looking at these guys working out there, you know, and, and running around on those rafters like they're monkeys, you know, they're 60, 70 feet in the air, boy, that doesn't interest me at all. But then again, they're much younger and more agile. And, and, and Mary went through her allowance like that. And I had no money left. And, and again, Mary liked to spend money. It compensated for the lack of Lincoln's attention. She spent money on redecorating. She spent money instead on shoes, on clothes, on gloves. She just spent and spent and spent. It was compensatory behavior because my guy, Lincoln, she always called him Lincoln, has no time for me. He's always shooing me away. Now on top of that, you know, Mary, Mary was never crazy. She was never crazy. And I know we've read that. I know we've heard that. She was never crazy. She was a distraught woman. Uh, she was not a well woman. She had untreated diabetes. Now that's a killer. I mean, nobody knew diabetes. She had untreated diabetes. She was bipolar. She had suffered a, a carriage accident and most likely had a, you know, had a concussion and was never completely right after that as well. And we talk about concussions today, don't we? And I'm out of money. And, and she's, where can I find more money? I went through my allowance like that. And she didn't go to Walmart. I mean, she ordered out of the catalog the finest carpets from, New, from the New York, from downtown New York and Philadelphia, uh, the finest carpets and wallpaper, you know, from, from Paris. And her credit, when Mary walked in to buy jewelry, when Mary walked in to buy anything, the fact that you are Mrs. Lincoln, your credit is good here. Just sign. Uh, we'll build the government later. And Mary, what a joke. This is great. I just spend, 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 and the bills will come in later. And I don't have any money, but I've got to cover it a little bit, because Lincoln will find out, and there'll be hell to pay. So she explained this problem, her money problem, to, the, to one of the caretakers of the, uh, of the White House, and the grounds, and the barn, and the livestock, and horses as well, and he was the property manager, if you will, of the, of the grounds of the White House. And she was lamenting the fact, I'm out of money. And he said, well, there's no problem here. You need money, Mrs. Lincoln? I'm out of money. I, 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 the work will never be completed. And he said, well, there's no problem here. These are the big leagues. What I can simply do for you, Mrs. Mrs. President, and I, I can move money from my account to your account you know, to cover the costs, or some of the costs. And Mary was a quick, quick thinker. You know, Mary saw an opportunity. She said, you can do that? You can move money from one account to another account? These are the major leagues. <laughs> this, is the, this is the big leagues. We can do anything you want. So I'll move money into your, in, in your expense account. Well, thank you very much. I'll make certain to keep this secret, but you have an ally in me. Thank you very much. Mary was a quick learner, and she found out that cabinet members were more than willing to move money from their accounts into her accounts because it gave them access to the president, because as first lady, she will talk me up and say, what a wonderful fellow your secretary of, of the interior is. What a wonderful fellow 
your secretary of the agriculture was. So Mary knew how to play that game. And Mary was coquettish. Mary, uh, Mary was a coquettish, a good looking woman. You know, as, you know, as female beauty was defined at that time. And, and she, she was a tease. She was a coquette. She flirted. And access to the president. And this work is being done. And, and Lincoln, Mary, Mary, how are you doing all of this? You are remarkable with that budget. <laughs> spinning, spinning straw into gold. I'm very good at what I do. I, I, get, I get $2 for a dollar spent. I'm an excellent negotiator. <laughs> and that's going to really haunt her uh, later on. I mean, Lincoln will never find out. But I'll just pass this along and I'll move, and I'll move along. That when Lincoln was up for re-election, we're not going to do this today, but when Lincoln was up for re-election, the concern was, and there was real concern, that he was going to get beat. And if he gets beat, he'll find out all this money that I've spent. And then there's going to be trouble because the bills will come due. But he didn't get beat. So Mary, boom, 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 let's get it done. And the grand opening, the grand opening of the brand new redecorated, renovated White House is in the winter of 1862. And it was the hottest ticket in town. And Mary very carefully chose, you know, who would be invited to see this brand new White House. And again, it hadn't been redecorated since Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson left town, left the White House in 1836. So it needed work. <coughs> like our homes sometimes need work, right? You know, you need to, uh, uh, you, need a little, you need a little improvement. You need a little tightening up. And Mary very carefully selected who would come and left off the list, you know, were those White House, were those Washington socialites who, when they heard that Mary or the Lincolns had been elected, mocked Mary. She heard this. Uh, and she remembered two years later. I'll bet, I'll bet, I'll bet she doesn't have teeth. She's from the frontier, the frontier. I'll bet you she chose, she chews tobacco. I'll bet you she shows up barefoot, probably in some cheap cotton dress. Mary was a, a very urbane, well-read, cosmopolitan woman, and she knew how to play the game. And she was a flirt, and she was good at it, and attractive, and bipolar. And, and that's always a problem, isn't it? You know, who's gonna, who's gonna, who am I going to meet today? You know, who's coming down for breakfast today? You know, or if I'm going to pick somebody up, you know, who's, who's, coming, who's coming out? What kind of a mood am I going to get into? You know, what, what's going to happen here? And you know when somebody's really bipolar, and there's no medication for it, that that mood can shift in a half an hour, can it? Just like that. It can shift across the table at dinner. It can shift dancing. Just hit a switch, and suddenly, what just happened here? So Mary... Uh, Lincoln's secretaries, you know, always referred to her, you know, as her satanic majesty. We have no idea who's coming down these stairs and to cause trouble for, for the boss. Uh, they, they, uh, they liked Lincoln, and they knew that Mary was a handful and unpredictable. So the party's on, and it is catered, it is catered, it is everything is top shelf. And Lincoln shows up. Obviously, he shows up, and you know, he's looking around, and where's my wife? Where's Mrs. Lincoln? Where, um, everybody's there, and there, you know, the champagne, and Link, Link, Lincoln didn't drink, you know, but the champagne, and, and, and the oysters, and all the finery you can expect on that table. And, well, where's, where's Mrs. Lincoln? Where's Mrs. Lincoln? Here she comes. Here she comes. The grand entrance, like Loretta... Already young, the grand entrance. Mary, Mary, she was decked up. Her seamstress, her personal seamstress, uh, Kexley, a black seamstress, had sewed her into a dress. She looked good, all white and, and decorated with small animals, fawns, if you will, and deers, and, and it is very tight-fitting in Lincoln. And her hair's all done up. You know, the whole the, the makeover. 
You know, the glamour shot, you know, the makeover. We've seen you, know, haven't we? You get that makeover. Wow, I never knew you looked that good. And Lincoln, and Mary. And then he notices the plunging neckline. He said, Mary, I was there. Mary, where's the rest of your dress? <laughs> where's the rest of your dress? And then he notices the long train. Oh, it's in the tail. She had a, like a wedding gown. Oh, that's where it is. And it was a wonderful coming out party for the White House. The only cloud, dark cloud in all of that is, is Willie and Tad, you know, were both upstairs sick. They were burning up with a 103, 104 temperature. They had, been, obviously, they're drinking water pumped in from the Potomac, and it's 1862. So it's not like it went through a treatment. And, and they both are burning up with typhoid. And both parents throughout the night are running up, you know, up and down the stairs checking on the children. And for Mary, frantic. Mary was worried about everything, frantic. And remember, her brothers had served for the Confederacy. And, and, and three of them had died fighting for the Confederacy. That her, her mother, her biological mother had died early on, and we talked about this. And Dad quickly remarried, and the new and and and, and the new Mrs. Todd wanted nothing to do with the children from the former marriage. We talked about this. It happens, doesn't it? That was then, Robert, and this is now. Your wife is deceased. I'm sure she was a lovely woman, but we're married now, and we're going to move along, and we're going to have eventually seven children. So. And he remarried five months after his wife died. I mean, even today, when people would raise their eyebrows a little bit, wouldn't they? Five months, she's still moving. <laughs> so this was very, very difficult for Mary to, you know, to absorb, to understand. Well, uh, their, their firstborn, their Eddie, you know, had died in Illinois. I've got two children burning out with temperatures, and. Three of my brothers are fighting for the Confederacy, and all three of them will be killed in the war. And, and, and Mary with her again, you know, with her bipolar, untreated, untreated diabetes, you know, her OCD. And I cannot get my husband's attention. He's too busy for me, and he shoes me away. And she needed him. She was dependent on him. He was her sheet anchor. He, kept, he was her North Star. He kept her balanced as best he could. In fact, sometimes, uh, as the two secretaries remember, one day she was so over the top and so frantic and at the top of her voice and, 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 and screaming and yelling and, and, and so forth that he put his arm around her shoulder and he brought her to the window. And he said, you see the roof of that, of that, of that room, of that building? Do you know what that is? That's the insane asylum. Now that's what they called them back then. And that's where you're going if you don't stop it. I've got a job to do. We don't think about that, do we? Can you imagine? Mary, if you don't stop it, I'm going to put you in the nut house. I'm going to have you locked up. That doesn't get in the history books, does it? I mean, after the war, after the war, her oldest boy, Robert, had her locked down, didn't he? Because of her behaviors. And as the physicians or the psychiatrists, they called them alienists back then. Your mother is not insane. Your mother is a broken woman. Her sons, her husband, the war, and the conditions that she, she is not insane. She is a broken woman in so many parts. I'll come back to that later on. Not, not today, but the next time we, we chat. It's a great party. And Willie will die. You know, Willie will die of typhus. And, and, and Willie will be buried in D.C. And when Lincoln dies, Willie is disinterred and, and brought back with his father. But for Mary, she never went to the wake. Uh, I can't bear the thought of my beautiful boy at 10 or 11, my Willie. And he's dead. Willie's dead, and she obsessed over Ted to make sure nothing happened to him. She never went in his bedroom again. She never went to the wake. She never attended the funeral. 
and she sold all of his clothes, all of his furniture, and all of his toys. I can't bear even, the, even to, to see the memory of my boy. Now that's tough stuff. I mean, that gets, you just don't forget that. I mean, even today, for, 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 for you as a parent, to predecease, now to have your children predecease you is difficult to deal with. No matter how, no matter what the cause, that my child, my boy, my girl has predeceased me. And she's got two children now. And now she's worried about Tad and beyond worry about Robert, you know, who's been admitted to Harvard, not because Lincoln agreed to build a building, all right? <laughs> you know, in fact, he, he failed the first series of entrance tests and he had to go to a prep school, Robert, to be able to boost his grades. He had to be tutored and he got admitted and he wanted to serve. He wanted to, all the Harvard men have left. And he told his father, the, all the Harvard men have left, the Harvard, the Harvard division, the Harvard regiment. And, and I have found several times a white feather on my bed. And the white feather was a sign of cowardice. A white feather. I need to serve. All the Harvard men are gone. I'm embarrassed. And Lincoln, I understand that. I'm a commander-in-chief, and you're not in the war. And I've sent so many thousands of young men to their deaths. I understand this. And he went to Mary, and he said, and he explained to her, Robert has to enlist. He has to wear the uniform. And she had a meltdown. No, no, no. I've lost three brothers, I've lost two sons. No, 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 not my firstborn, no. And as, the, and as the secretaries remembered, she was on her knees, gripping you know, Lincoln's, Lincoln's kneecaps. Please, please, no. And he peeled her fingers off his, kneecap, off his kneecaps. He has to go, he has to go. He's a man, he has to go, get over it. And I'll see what I can do to get him posted to a relatively secure position. So what, what Lincoln did, and he contacted General Grant, you know, who by now was the head of the Union Army. We haven't got there yet. And he asked Grant, is there a place on your staff for my son? And you know the answer always is yes, huh? You're the commander in chief. You signed my paycheck. There is a place on my staff for your son. And Lincoln was able to persuade Mary. He's in a safe place, relatively speaking. I mean, Grant always led from the front. He was always in the thick of it, but at least he's on Grant's staff. And he knows that my son is precious cargo. So, so there's, there's Mary, you know, dealing with the, the tension, the death, the trauma of the war. And she's traumatized from birth. With the victory, so-called so -called victory at Antietam, Lee left, McClellan was fired, and Lincoln has been thinking about using the, using his authority as commander-in-chief, you know, to issue an executive order to free the slaves, to, to free the slaves in the slave states that are in rebellion. And, and that he had talked about it with the cabinet, and it will be the man who became his good friend, you know, William Seward, who recommended to Lincoln that do we need, if you're going to issue an executive order, the, the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, you simply can't just draw it up. It's that it will be our la it, will, it will be seen as our last shriek on the retreat, a desperate measure. We need, Mr. President, we need a victory. You need to cover this preliminary emancipation proclamation with a victory. Otherwise, it'll be seen as, as he said, our last shriek, that's his word, our last shriek on the retreat, something desperate to, to turn the course of the war. We're losing the war. And Antietam, Lincoln used Antietam as a victory. I mean, Lee wasn't defeated. Lee's army wasn't destroyed, but Lee left. Lee had gone back to Virginia. And I fired McClellan, and now I'm looking for a new guy. He'll find him later on in Grant. 
but that will come in 1864. And Lincoln drafts the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. It is an executive order. It's from the president's desk. And, and what the Emancipation Proclamation does, well, it does a number, preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. What it does is, one, it, it settles down the yelping of the abolitionists. In other words, you know, you haven't done anything to end slavery, that we can use this war to end slavery, to completely remake the country and to rid the nation of the sin, the stain, the immorality of slavery. So I've been able to tamp down the, the, the abolitionists by threatening to do this, it will delay, at least for the time being, the recognition of the Confederacy by Great Britain and France, read caught in there. And we talked about last week, that the issue last month, the issue with the Trent Affair. And what I'm offering Jefferson Davis, what I'm offering the Confederacy, is to rejoin the Union. I'll give you 90 days to get back into the Union with slavery. 90 days. If, if, if you're not back in in 90 days, this preliminary emancipation will be a real deal. And I will free all the slaves in the slave states that are in rebellion. So at the end of 90 days, as Jefferson Davis said, this makes reunion impossible. At the end of 90 days, it's January 1, 1863, the new year, and Lincoln, I'm going to move this from the preliminary to the permanent Emancipation Proclamation as, a, as an executive order. Just a little bit about it. It was the custom, it was the custom back then, that on New Year's Day, the President would stand on the front steps of the White House and greet people online that wish to wish him and his family a a happy new year. I mean, that was the custom. It's a lovely custom, isn't it? It ended with Herbert Hoover. But it's a sweet custom. And, and Lincoln stood online most of the day, shaking hands and shaking hands and shaking hands. And remember, there's no Secret Service protection. I mean, there were Army personnel there, but there's no Secret Service yet. That doesn't come until McKinley's assassination. And there's a Secret Service, but they deal with counterfeiting. And and, and, Lincoln, and Lincoln had told the cabinet, you know, that with nightfall, the end of the day, and, you know, when that line dwindles down to no one, that I'd like you to join me in the cabinet room. I'm going to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, and I think you ought to be there. This is historic. And as Lincoln said, if I'm remembered for anything, it will be for this. And you may want to be present when I sign the Emancipation Proclamation. And some of these guys weren't sure that he would sign it that he's bluffing, that at the end he would hesitate. At the end he, and we're talking about four billion dollars in property, you know, by, just by the stroke of a pen, you know, to expropriate four billion dollars of property. He wouldn't do it. He won't do this, it's just too much. So Lincoln is there, they, 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 they show up, and there's a document in front of him, in front of him. And when he picks up the pen, it fumbles out of his fingers. And then he tries to pick it up again, it fumbles out of his fingers. His hand is swollen because of all the handshaking. Oh. Makes sense, doesn't it? Now, some people saw this as a sign. You know, this is, you ought not do this. You can't grip the pen. This is too big, too much. This is, this is taking away private property. You can't do that. And Lincoln said for ice. He sent a, a servant for ice, and he iced his hand, and when the swelling had been reduced, he picked up the pen, and he signed it. And he signed it with his full name, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln typically signed A. Lincoln. He did not like the first name Abraham. I don't know why he didn't <laughs> like it. He signed A. Lincoln, A. Lincoln. He signed it with his full name. And the Emancipation Proclamation did not apply. I want, to be, I want to be very careful with you here. I want to nuance the document. Read it. It's disappointing. I'll tell you why in a moment. That it did not free a single slave who was not in rebellion. 
In other words, Lincoln drew it up very carefully, like a, a like a legal document, like a divorce document. You know, it applies here, it applies there, visiting rights over there. You know, you get the bird, I get the dog. Or whatever, I get the dog, you get the bird, whatever. A very legalese document. It did not apply to the slave states that had not left the Union yet. So that meant Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, and Kentucky. It, not, it did not apply to them. And, 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 but Lincoln, you know, over the course of the next few months and years, meeting from time to time with the, the governors of these four states, he told them it's coming. It's coming. You see, what Congress had already done prior to the Battle of Antietam is they had passed the measure that Lincoln had signed. They had passed the measure ending slavery in the District of Columbia because that's where the federal authority ran, didn't it? The District of Columbia was not a member of a state. I mean, it was neutral. It was the capital. So federal authority ruled in D.C. And Congress freed all the slaves in the District of Columbia and they gave them 300 bucks. The owners, 300 bucks per freed slave. That was well below the market value. Uh, the market value at the outbreak of the Civil War for a prime field hand was about 1,200 or 1,300 bucks in their money. For you and for me, it's a mid-sized Toyota. It's about 22,000 bucks. We're talking about an expensive purchase here. So, District of Columbia finished. And Lincoln is coming. And now he's made it come. And he told these governors, it's coming. It's coming. And it did not, it only applied to those states in rebellion that were not yet under federal control. So it applied fully to an Alabama, fully to a Mississippi, for example. It did not apply to all of Virginia because parts of Virginia were occupied by federal troops. And Lincoln wants to be careful here. It's a very legalese document. In fact, it lacks the emotion. It lacks the vitality of, of the Gettysburg Address or the second, or, or, or the second inaugural. And, and Lincoln wrote a very careful document. He did not read it. Read it carefully. It doesn't have any, any sizzle. And Lincoln did not, say, did not write and say it's because it's the right thing. It's a humanitarian thing to do. I oppose it. Because Lincoln did not want to set up post-war challenges in the court that you cannot take my property and deny me, you know, life, liberty, and property without due process because you as president, by an executive order, said, it disturbs me. It offends my sleep. It's the right thing to do. It won't hold up. Lincoln was an attorney. Lincoln knew the power of words. I need to be careful. It only applies in those slave states in rebellion. And the last phrase, and this was inserted by Seward, who said, this doesn't have any ring to it. I mean, it's a stale paper. Lincoln, it needs to be a stale paper. I do not want to open up, open up the government to lawsuits to, to get our property back because you simply did not acknowledge the Constitution, life, liberty, and property without due process of law. And it's Seward who inserts the line to give it a bit of a lift, that, that you are henceforth and forever free. Henceforth and forever free. We talked about this the last time we met, that from now on, black men, black women with their children, if you run into union lines, you will be henceforth and forever free. Here's the policy. Now there'll be no one general does this, one colonel does that, and to deny the South manpower. You see, that slaves were used on the front lines for the Confederacy. And they were used to bury the dead, to treat the wounded, to repair railroads, to repair bridges, to restrain telegraph. And if these people, these black men, are fleeing into, and by the way, some blacks were given weapons to shoot at Union troops. And that's a whole big story, that at the end of the war, if you support us, you may be given your freedom. That run into Union lines so that black men will not be able to work with the Confederate Army to do scut work, ordinary work, in the lines. That, a, that shovel will be picked up by a white man and not a black man. And to pick up that shovel, he needs to put down his rifle. So we're going to deny the Confederate Army the manpower 
of black men at the front. And women and older black men, you run, that means you're going to have to get the crops in on your own. And that means you're going to have to harvest them on their own. Run, 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 son, run, run, girl, run. You won't be returned. And that means white women will have to do the work behind the lines, and white guys will have to repair bridges and pick up an axe rather than a rifle. So to deny the Confederacy manpower, again, it did not apply in a Kentucky, in a Maryland, in a Delaware, or a Missouri. It's coming. It's coming, fellas, but not yet. It's preliminary. Lincoln knew it was preliminary. And he knew this. And this is going to have an impact on the 1864 election. Read the document. It's a page. I mean, it's disappointing knowing how well and how beautifully, how fluently, Lincoln was able to use the language. It's a legal document. And as I said, it's like a bill of lading. That goes there. It doesn't apply here. It doesn't apply there. You know, you get the dog and you get the cat. Very carefully laid out. In 1864, and I want, I want to connect this up now and then we'll back up a little bit. In 1864, when Lincoln was running for re-election, and there was even some doubt whether or not he would be nominated again, the war was not going well in 1864 at all. Grant was stalled in front of, in front of Richmond. Grant was really stalled. Uh, Lee was good at defensive tactics of slowing things down. Uh, the 1864 election, that when the Republican Party renominated Lincoln and Hannibal Hamlin was displaced and Andrew Johnson was on the ticket for reasons we'll talk about later, that Lincoln wanted the language, the spirit of the Emancipation Proclamation to become one of the planks in the party platform because he knew as an executive order that it could be, it could be overturned by the next president. I mean, any executive order can be overturned by the next president. It only has the force of the signature. Lincoln, well, the first executive orders were issued by Washington. You know, he issued eight of them. So there was a precedent there. But it's only my signature in the executive order. It could be overturned by Congress. Um, it could be overturned by the Supreme Court, as, as they can be today. It could be overturned by the next president in 1864, if I get beat, who will rescind, repeal the executive order. I want it in the party platform as a plank, as a plank in the platform that if I get reelected, that plank of the, of the end of slavery will become an amendment. And that's the Steven Spielberg film, isn't it? The film seven or eight years ago, uh, Spielberg's Lincoln. Basically, it deals with the crafting and the passage by Congress of the 13th Amendment before it goes out to the states to be ratified. Basically, that's what that film is about. Lincoln did not live to see it. The first time the word slavery is mentioned in the Constitution and all the word itself is in the 13th Amendment. Other than that, it's not mentioned because the, those who framed the Constitution were so sensitive about that that word and that third rail of politics that they used <laughs> euphemisms for slavery, such as people bound to service, bound to labor. The word slavery was not used. And the first time it's there is in that 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. So Lincoln is looking up the road here a little bit, assuming this victory and assuming he's reelected. And those are assumptions. So in 1863, January, it's on the books. And, and in that Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln, do not cause any unrest, just run. You know, no violence, no sabotage, just run into Union lines. When you hear the boom of artillery, when you, when you see those Union soldiers run into the lines, run boy, run, run girl, run, and you will be henceforth and forever free. And that begs the question, and that had to be determined later on. Will these men be asked to serve in the United States Navy or the United States Army and not just work for Union commanders to do repair jobs, repair bridges? 
And that will come slowly, won't it? You know, that, that black men will put on those, those blue uniforms, as Frederick Douglass said. Once these black men, my boys here, two boys, you know, put on these blue uniforms, and they've got these big brass buttons, you know, with that eagle and the flag, they are men. That they will go into the South as well and help liberate their sisters and brothers bound to slavery. So there are, these are, these are, these are important times. It's, in fact, the, the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1863, the stock market collapsed. It's completely collapsed. This is out of control. This country is being remade. And desertions among white soldiers spiked. We enlisted to restore the Union, not to free black men. They're going to come north and take our away and chase our women. We didn't sign up for this. And so desertions increased. Enlistments fell off. The stock market collapsed. And here is Lincoln. Can you imagine the tension? And, and trying to keep all of this straight. And the word from the front is stalemate, stalemate, stalemate. And, and, and Lincoln, Lincoln using the telegraph office, which was adjacent to the White House. The telegraph was brand new. I mean, Lincoln was a, a high-tech president. He was interested in new weapons, new cannon. He was interested in the use of the Merrimack and the Monitor. He was interested in technology. And with the telegraph, as those telegraph wires were strung across the front, he could keep in touch with his generals, specifically Grant, and follow the war. He could project his voice, his influence, his direction within minutes and to follow the progress of the war rather than waiting for a week or so for a cable to come in about what had happened 10 days ago. Uh, McClellan, I've driven Lee from our soil. It's all our soil. Chase him while well, he's ghosted himself across the Potomac. I gotta fire this guy. This, I, he's all talk and no action. He looks good, but he doesn't deliver. So, so here it is, 1863. Lincoln has issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and Lincoln, in 1863, gets a major, major victory. Lee has come north again, and this time into Pennsylvania. If I can, if I can have a major victory on northern soil, once again, to affect public opinion, and maybe influence the outcome of the 1864 election, and enlistments, and northern morale, the arithmetic of the thing. And in, in, this, in May, June, yeah, May, June, in May, June of 1863, uh, there was a gathering, a gathering of the high command, a gathering of the high command in Richmond. What do we do for the campaign season coming on? Where do we go? And, and Jefferson Davis and Longstreet wanted to go west. Let's go west and protect Vicksburg. Let's go west and see if we can rough up some Union armies out west. And Lee, with the prestige of, of Lee, and, and with Antietam and now, and, and now Chancellorsville, Chancellorsville was a great loss personally for Lee. He lost Stonewall Jackson to his own snipers, to his own guard, guard detail. Stonewall Jackson liked to do his own reconnaissance. So he was out checking out the, the positions of the Union. And somehow the password got mixed up. And when Jackson wasn't quick enough to give the password to move through the picket line, or forgot it, or it wasn't heard properly by pickets, by sentries, he was shot out of the saddle. And, and Jackson was Lee's right-hand man. Lee had two right-hand men. I got Jackson, I got, and, I've got, and, and then I've got Pete Longstreet, and I'm in the middle. You know, and I'm bobbing and weaving in the middle, and I've got my left and I got my right. I got my boys. I got my fighters. I've got Stonewall Jackson, who was a little crazy. <laughs> a little crazy. But he was a fighter. And I got Longstreet. Longstreet, good old Pete. Longstreet was the only general that Lee used his first name Pete. My war horse, Pete. Now I've only got Pete. And I need to take Longstreet's division, not Longstreet, I need to take Jackson's division and divide it up into, I have to divide it. 
into two untested commanders. It's going to be a very important piece. People matter. How many times have you told me? I thought I told you that, right? People matter. I've got two untested commanders. I have to, they're good, you know, I mean, they're good at what they do with that level of command. You know, but now I've divided Lincoln's, uh, I've divided, uh, I've divided Jackson's division. And now I have two new division commanders. Uh, I'm not sure they're up for it. They're good at what they did, but I'm not sure they're, they're ready for the next promotion. That happens, doesn't it? You know, you're good as a number two or a number three, but you're not ready for the big job. You don't have the confidence. You don't have the, the hoistle sometimes. But I've got to go north into Pennsylvania. We need a victory on Union soil. We need to turn this thing around. And into Pennsylvania comes Robert E. Lee, who around that table, gentlemen, we need to go north. We need to go north. If I can defeat a Union army in Pennsylvania, Maybe then we'll have our victory. And Lee took the Army of Northern Virginia to Gettysburg. And some of us have been to Gettysburg, haven't we? The largest battle ever fought in the Western Hemisphere. The cannonading could be heard as, as, as far northeast as Pittsburgh. What a battle. And we'll save that because that's going to give us the Gettysburg Address, and that's going to give us Lincoln, that I will be nominated, and I'm bringing Grant to command. And I want him to stay on the front the entire season. And, and, and Lincoln tells Grant, I'll be in touch with the, with the cable. Always keep in touch, with, not the cable, the telegraph. But you, sir, when you're in the saddle, you are the Union. Because Grant said, I do not want to fight this war from a desk in Washington. Just keep in touch. I'll be in the telegraph office. Keep in touch. When you are in the saddle, you are the Union. You do what, need, what needs to be done. And get Lee. Get Lee. Chase him. Bag him. I want his head. I want his scalp on my belt. Get Lee. I'll leave you with that. Maybe a question or an observation. If you've been to Gettysburg, it's all there. Uh, don't let me forget to tell you about my very special Gettysburg story, did I? About going to that, that home that's not on the tour. Very special invitation. And I wept. I wept. I wasn't prepared for what I saw. And prepared for what I was told. You know, just after a while you've seen it all, I get a little jaded. Well, I'll see you later. Take care. Bye. -bye.